Hello and welcome to our session on the military backbone for democracy. Uh, all of you know by now, I think, that we welcome your questions. We want your questions. Ask them through the virtual conference room or through our social media channels, please. The NATO alliance has been pushed and pulled and challenged in many different ways in recent months and weeks and even days, uh, included by, including by COVID-19. We're going to take a look at the health of the alliance here today and talk about some of the major issues around security and defense with our distinguished guest today. Uh, Mircea Joana is a distinguished Romanian diplomat. He is a former Minister of Foreign Affairs and former Ambassador to the United States. He now is serving as Deputy Secretary General of NATO. Thank you so much for joining us here today. Thank you so much for having me, and I'm looking forward uh, to the conversation. I want to ask you, first of all, about an item that's in the news today, uh, which is about a confrontation between French and Turkish naval ships in the Mediterranean. Talk for me to me yeah, just for a you, minute about this challenge this poses to have two NATO allies having this kind of conflict. You mentioned uh, or you, you, you asked the question about the health of the NATO alliance. And I have to say that we are in, uh, in, uh, in very good shape. Uh, it's an alliance that has existed for 71 years. We've seen in our long history already many, many delicate moments, tensions from the Suez Canal uh, all the way to, to many other things. So from some time to time, uh, an alliance of 30 democracies, not every ally um, is seeing eye to eye to the other. And it's true that uh, the complications uh, that are abandoning uh, in the Middle East are creating sometimes also some, some pressures for us. But I think as uh, Secretary General Stoltenberg mentioned yesterday after uh, the second day of our defense ministerial, um, uh, the two sides are presenting uh, the information to our uh, military uh, uh, institutions. We'll make, of course, uh, a serious, uh, objective, uh, balanced investigation, and we'll find out. The most important thing I wanted to mention, that uh, even during this, this, this great stress, this great uh, crisis, this great drama, which uh, continues to be the pandemic, the Alliance has behaved very well. Our uh, readiness is still intact. Uh, our missions and operations are fully functional. We had to downsize, of course, some of our exercises, including a major American one on European soil. But by and large, the alliance has vitality. We show solidarity amongst allies. Uh, many nations have uh, supported each other. Uh, my country of origin, Romania, managed to, 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 to send help to, to other allies, uh, to Italy, uh, Germany has helped in many directions. So I would say that sometimes uh, small hiccups do appear, but by and large, the alliance is, uh, is strong, our resilience uh, is there, and I'm, I'm very confident that we'll move on for many, many decades to come. So you characterize this confrontation of naval vessels in the Mediterranean just as a hiccup? This is something that does not concern you particularly? I'm not trying to diminish uh, the, this incident that, that, that occurred. Uh, I'm just trying to say that we are accustomed to, from time to time, hopefully not very often, uh, to have situations where national interest of, uh, of allies not to coincide. And Libya is a very complicated issue. You see um, a variable geometry of players uh, uh, trying to influence the game and the outcome over there. We are concerned about uh, a transfer of Russian aircraft a significant increase of Russian presence in Libya, uh, we are concerned about, uh, about the situation. What I'm just saying is say that there is a tradition, there is a sense uh, that amongst the allies, when we, we have difficulties amongst the allies, we discuss them in earnest. This was the case uh, the day before yesterday and yesterday, the defense ministerial. Uh, there was a very frank conversation and we are trying to, to find a solution, um, uh, investigating the situation and hoping that this will be an episode that will not occur again. The issue with Turkey is a longer lasting one. Uh, it has a larger frame uh, and includes the purchase of Russian missile defense systems, just as an example. Um, and I'm wondering if the, if the democratic deficit, which we're also seeing in Turkey, um, presents itself as a strategic challenge to the alliance. Speaking of, of strategy and strategic, 
Turkey is a, an exceptionally uh, important uh, and, and full of strategic weight ally of ours. So while we are uh, uh, witnessing situations that uh, are of concern, uh, this intention of uh, acquiring uh, Russian missile defense systems is something that is of concern to us. While we see some actions that Turkey has taken that uh, should have been probably uh, um, brought forward to the alliance, we cannot underestimate the massive strategic significance and relevance of this great uh, ally nation. It's, it's a major military, has a geography which is complicated. It's a nation that has been uh, affected by terrorist attacks like no other uh, nation in the world. It has a complicated geography. So we try here uh, at NATO to, 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 to find the right balance uh, between our interest to keep uh, Turkey uh, as, a, as a trusted and important ally, while when things are not going as they should, just to have a very candid conversation, which is the case uh, here in Brussels or uh, amongst the NATO capitals. And this is something which is already a public domain sometimes. Uh, I also want to ask you about another um, recent piece of news, uh, President Trump's intention to withdraw 9,500 troops uh, from Germany. I know that the defense ministers of NATO met this week, Secretary Esper spoke with them. Is there any indication that there's going to be a reversal or a modification of this decision on the part of the U.S.? Uh, Secretary Esper informed the Allies about uh, this situation. Um, it's it's uh, uh, an evolving situation. There was has been an announcement. We have not seen uh, as yet any practical uh, steps. But I have to, to to put this this announcement, which is uh, still work in progress, into a broader context. We have seen American presence in Europe increasing significantly over the last years. The U.S. is leading a battle group in Poland. Uh, they are part of many rotational uh, uh, presence of American troops in many places. They are present in my country, Romania. They are present in Norway. They deployed in, in, in Spain uh, missile defense systems uh, uh, at sea. We are witnessing a significant uh, and important and relevant uh, American involvement in Europe. So we have to keep also, uh, if you want, a certain perspective of the situation. Uh, we understand that the U.S. is also analyzing its global posture because it's a global superpower. It's not only Europe, which is uh, an importance of importance to the U.S. But I know that this alliance of ours is important not only for Europe, but also for our North American friends. America is using many times the geography and the, the presence in Europe for power projection into areas of interest to the U.S., not only to us. And I think the bond, including the title of, the demo of, 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 this, of this great conference, uh, uh, the democracy that unites us, is a very important bond. And I think that if we want to have the political West remaining strong and having uh, a decisive say in the world, we need this transatlantic bond. And I'm convinced, and we are convinced, that American interest and, and involvement in Europe will continue. And despite the rhetoric that we've heard from President Trump, he's been very disparaging of the NATO alliance. And some people have said it, it illustrates a lack of commitment on his part to this yeah. transatlantic relationship. You know, uh, there was a lot of talk about burden sharing. And in a way, the fact that uh, President Trump was explicit and sometimes blunt about this thing also expresses a reality. This is why Secretary General Stoltenberg, all of us, are, are, are making the case to the allies that uh, have made a commitment to spend 2% of their GDP on defense, to keep up uh, to their commitments. This is not something that is uh, an unusual thing. I remember uh, in my days in Washington, President Clinton and then uh, President uh, G.W. Bush, and then I remember President Obama uh, and his vice president, uh, Joe Biden, uh, always telling the European allies or non-US allies, to be more, more precise, to, to, to have a fairer burden sharing. I think this is not a criticism towards the alliance is, is, I think, an encouragement for us Europeans to, 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 to invest more in our own security. So uh, I would say in the last period of time, uh, the relationship between Washington and the alliance has been positive. And I'm convinced that irrespective of the outcome of the American elections in November, this will continue to be a robust relationship across, uh, across the pond. Let me ask you one question about those European contributions to NATO. 
Um, you're right. Um, the president has been pressing for an increase, and yet the world finds itself in the middle of an economic crisis because of the pandemic. Is that going to impact European countries' ability to contribute more to the alliance? Listen, uh, uh, an economic downturn, which is to be expected and is already happening, is a severe shock. And I think nobody can underestimate uh, the huge importance for nations uh, in Europe, in NATO, across the world, to find the right balance between economic recovery, uh, saving jobs, and, and investing into, into uh, economic recovery. That's, that's normal. That's absolutely normal. But what I'm saying and what we are saying and the SEPGEN is saying that this is in a way a false dilemma because we say that we need to invest more in uh, education and healthcare and of course uh, uh, financial st stimuli for our economy. But it's a false dilemma to choose between uh, investing your own security because without security there is no economy, there is no social services, there is nothing. So what we are convinced the nations will will be, of course, be affected, but uh, the problems to our uh, common security have not disappeared uh, with the COVID. COVID has not replaced the security threats. Uh, they are adding up to those things. I'm convinced that in their wisdom, with difficult choices, difficult choices, uh, the leaders of the alliance will continue to invest in our defense and our security as part also of the economic recovery. If we, defense, if we invest in our defense sector, if we invest in, in stronger resilience, if we invest in stronger military contribution, uh, also for, God forbid, future pandemics, if we invest in innovation and new technologies, this is also good for uh, the overall economy, is creating jobs. So we, we are making this case, and I think this case uh, has not only an interest for us in NATO, but may, makes also strategic, political, economic, and social sense. I want to push back just a little bit on, on your comment that you thought that COVID demonstrated the strength of the alliance. Um, the U.S. has taken very much a go-it-alone approach. They have said they're going to start cutting funding to the World Health Organization. Uh, we saw in Europe uh, some countries hoarding medical supplies. We saw the closure of borders. Some people looked at all of those things and said, this doesn't represent the strength of the European alliance. What this shows is that there's a fracturing What's your response to that? We should not uh, hide behind the bushes. Uh, the first reaction in many nations, almost probably in all those nations, was basically a return towards uh, your own national interest, towards your own citizens. And the first reaction, like in a major crisis, is to, to brace yourself. So we are not hiding that. And I think it would be a mistake for us not to tell the truth. The initial reaction was more egoistic. It was more selfish. It was more national. But the moment we, we, we went to the second stage of this, this fantastic uh, crisis, we have seen uh, solidarity reappearing. Uh, we have seen uh, allies helping each other. Uh, we have seen hundreds and hundreds of thousands of tons of medical equipment being shipped also through NATO strategic airlift. We have seen our medical doctors uh, in, 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 in harm's way. We have seen our military half a million of NATO military in the 30 allied nations coming to the rescue. We have seen more than 100 field hospitals being raised by our military. So yes, the first reaction was a sort of a, uh, a, 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 a temptation to go national. And if there is a lesson uh, to, to this crisis, and we are all of us drawing what we call lessons learned from this pandemic, that this kind of situations cannot be dealt on a, only on a national level. Uh, I've been part of many conversations in my, in my job uh, with the European Union, with the UN, with the G7. And the first reaction was, as I said, a little bit more selfish, but then we realized that together we are stronger. And I think for the future, uh, also this initial reaction, which was a little bit complicated, will be a lesson to be learned by all of us. And I'm convinced that in the end, uh, we'll become more resilient and also we'll become stronger together. We have a question here from the audience. Uh, given that the NATO alliance was founded as a deterrent to the Soviet Union, how can it continue to evolve and adjust to its new role in the modern world? Listen, uh, 71 years of this alliance. Um, um, now we are 30 members. We received our newest uh, ally, North Macedonia, just a few months ago. 
first of all, it was, uh, and it is, an alliance of democratic nations. And for my part of Europe, I lived in communist Romania half of my life. And the fact that we were returning to, to, the, to the political West was in itself a major statement of our desire to catch up with the lost historical uh, time that we were obliged basically to, to live through. But beyond the idea of a reunified Europe based on values on democracy, rule of law, and respect for individual freedoms, there is also a strategic proposition into this. We are a defensive alliance. We have not uh, invaded Crimea and amputated Ukraine of a part of its territory. It has been Russia. So uh, we have not invented terrorism and, and, and uh, uh, had these horrific attacks uh, on 9-11. We were the ones who have to defend the security of 1 billion citizens that are living on NATO soil. So adjusting to new security uh, challenges and evolutions is part of our DNA. So, so what, one of no, those no, 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 uh, no, Soviet Union and Russia. Let me say one thing, because I was the one as, uh, as Deputy Secretary General to make an invitation to our Russian counterparts, part of the NATO-Russia Founding Act, to resume our NATO-Russia Council, which is that part of deterrence and defense. And Russia has been aggressive lately, but also dialogue and engagement. That's a dual track approach. Unfortunately, our Russian counterparts uh, have declined so far uh, to re-engage in the NATO-Russia Council, we still do hope that they will uh, come back to the uh, to the table and discuss about uh, deterrence, defense. If, and, if I and may jump in here, Russia that. isn't the only issue. There's been a lot of talk during this this conference about China and the threat it poses. As you, I'm sure, know, the former National Security Advisor John Bolton uh, is promoting a book in which he says that President Trump asked President Xi for help with his re-election effort. Um, given what Bolton says in his book, when it comes to China, can NATO trust the U.S.? Listen, all NATO leaders met in London in last December. And for the first time, we were introduced in, in our final communique some language on China. We basically, our leaders stated, all 30 leaders stated that we have to explore both the challenges and the opportunities of the rise of China. This is not about an election campaign in the US or anybody else. That's a reality. That's a massive country that is, has the second largest defense budget in the world after the US, that has invested tremendous resources into high-end military capabilities. It's a nation that also has a big market and it's a big economic player globally. So I think it's only normal for us not to, we are not looking for a new adversary, but we have to look, because we are a defensive security alliance, into the impact on the geopolitical and geostrategic balance of the rise of China. This is, has nothing to do with uh, one administration or another. That's a fact, that's a, that's a strategic trend. And again, uh, we are uh, very, very attentive in making sure that we don't create new enemies, we don't need that, but also that we are careful in making sure that China is well understood also when it comes to our to, to their defense capabilities. And let me make you one point. There's a lot of talk about arms control. China has developed a significant arsenal uh, of, of missiles, uh, of, of high-end uh, technologies. And I think it's only normal for the US uh, and also for European allies to ask China and Russia to come back with the US to the negotiating table on arms control. So when you have, and you are trying to find uh, a global power status, in the case of China, there are also responsibilities that come with that position. And we encourage China to engage in this uh, conversation about the new architecture of arms control around the world. Part of the challenge with China is technological. There is at least the impression that they are ahead of us, certainly with 5G. Um, artificial intelligence, they're making a huge investment there. Can NATO overcome its aversion to risk and come up with the money and come up with a more streamlined um, purchasing set of procedures in order to be competitive in this space? Are you up to the challenge or not? 
let me tell you what, what we believe in uh, and what's the reality. It's also a race for technological supremacy between China and also other authoritarian regimes and us, the political West. And I say the political West, I'm including our partners, NATO partners in Australia, in Japan, in South Korea, in New Zealand, and many others around the world. We, we also know that we have the top universities in the world. Uh, 28 of the first 30 universities in the world are on Western soil, Western democratic political soil. We still have ingenuity and we have a capacity to adjust and adapt at national level, but also NATO level. So I'm absolutely convinced that this, this competition for technological supremacy, we have the arguments, the ingredients. We should not also underestimate the fact that China is mobilizing in a different way, state and private resources in one hand, and also amassing significant amount of data uh, that this can and is used for artificial intelligence and other things. But let me say one thing. Of course, sometimes we're a little bit risk adverse. Uh, sometimes our, let's say, more bureaucratic system is much slower than the private sector. This is why us in NATO, myself, uh, uh, as chair of the innovation board in NATO, we are reaching out to the private sector. We try to find more agile instruments of financing things. We are also in the business of, of, of learning what the private sector sometimes is doing much better than, than uh, governmental or uh, big institutions like ourselves. So yes, I'm convinced that this is a race that uh, we will prevail in because again, there is nothing more conducive to ingenuity, innovation uh, and progress than a free society. There's absolutely no, no question mark in my head, and I think in nobody's head, that in the end, an open society, a free society, um, a, a democratic society is far more conducive for innovation. And in the end, we'll have uh, uh, the, the, the final say in, in making sure that we can continue to have our technological edge intact in the years to come. Um, Mr. Deputy, Deputy Secretary General, we have got to leave it there. We're out of time. Thank you so much for joining us today. Great conversation. I enjoyed it. Thank you.